Good afternoon, everyone. It's my great, great pleasure to introduce you today to today's talk, which is NFTs in the art world, beyond the hype. The host here is Simon Denny, who'll be moderating this panel, and I will shortly be handing over to him. But before, I just wanted to make some housekeeping notes. Please do keep your masks on at all times in the audience, even if the panel doesn't have them on. And um, yeah, and those of you standing at the back, please do keep a distance. I do realize it's a very full panel. Anyway, without further ado, hand over to Simon, and I hope you enjoy the talk. OK. Um, thanks so, so much, uh, Jenny, and thanks to Art Basel for hosting uh, this very exciting conversation. Um, I am going to uh, just quickly by name introduce the panel, and then we will uh, just briefly tell you guys who we are, what we do. Um, and then we're going to go into some deeper discussions about what NFTs are, how they're behaving at the moment. I think particularly market structures might be something we focus on. Um, anyway, uh, so I'm Simon Denny. I'm an artist um, who uh, makes artwork about technology um, and people that make technology. Uh, I also make NFTs. Um, and uh, Holly uh, is an artist who uh, makes lots of things uh, from visual to audio. Um, uh, Maria Paula um, is a, uh, yeah, uh, I guess uh, a founder of a very special blockchain curation panel called JPEG. And Dan uh, is uh, the founder, co founder of uh, a very important, uh, yeah, NFT publishing platform called Folia.app. Um, but yeah, I'm going to let these guys talk through. Uh, their own thing, but I'm just going to give you a brief introduction first who I am, I think some visuals. This is a show that I have curated that is on right now uh, in Hamburg at the Kunstverein. It's called Proof of Stake. Um, and it's a, it's a show that um, tries to take into account um, a bunch of themes around art, ownership, and blockchains. Um, it includes artworks that are um, based on blockchain structures, so using blockchains as a medium. But also, as you can probably see, uh, older artworks from other, other moments, which I think speak to these themes as well. Um, I've done a couple of these shows. Uh, this is another exhibition called Proof of Work, uh, which was um, at the Schinkel Pavilion in Berlin in 2018, a very different moment uh, for blockchain and art. Um, uh, in the foreground, we have this fantastic uh, piece by Distributed Gallery, uh, who are one of my favorite uh, blockchain uh, based artwork groups. This was a, a money burning machine. You would literally put euros uh, into this vitrine. They would flame up and you would get a token, uh, a crypto token in response. It's in a giant uh, bubble uh, by Foam, uh, a collective who also have a blockchain company, um, which, use, which was uh, inflated by uh, the exhaust from an ETH mining computer. Um, so yeah, again, similar thing. Uh, here's a crypto kitty uh, in another bubble, uh, a, a sculptural intervention showing one of the first uh, NFTs uh, sold at auction by an auction house, um, which I think is maybe where a lot of people who come to Art Basel first probably put their attention into um, NFTs when uh, there was a huge bunch of rush of sales around March uh, at Sotheby's and Christie's. Uh, this crypto kitty. Um, designed by Gail Todorovsky um, and Dapper Labs, uh, was sold on a little hardware wallet uh, in 2018 um, at a Christie's uh, Ethereum consensus event. Um, so kind of a, a precursor to, uh, to March. Um, I also do NFTs. Um, I do slightly perverse NFTs. Uh, these ones uh, have been uh, NFTs that take over old NFTs and put new assets on top of them as a kind of a, a hijack. Um, I also have one uh, auctioning uh, today, closing tomorrow, uh, for the Kunsthalle Basel, because I'm in an exhibition called Information Today, which recalls a very important um, exhibition at the MoMA that happened in the 60s. Uh, it's a new uh, exhibition curated by Elena Filipovic. Um, and uh, this is a, an NFT simply of a JPEG of an economist chart. Um, the proceeds will go to the Kunsthalle and to the state of Switzerland. Um, Holly. Oh, actually, this is the little bridge uh, one that I put in because uh, this is an NFT 
that uh, Maria Paola gave me, uh, and it's kind of inspired by Holly. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a project <laughs> called Three Words, um, and I think I'll, with that, pass the, oh, pass the thing on to Maria Paola, yeah. Hi, uh, so I'm Maria Paula. I've been in the blockchain space since 2017, working and interested on crypto before. And I got in touch with the NFT crowd very, very early in 2018. I started immediately collecting and also writing about NFTs. I published uh, some of the very first early research uh, on the state of the NFT market, which was very, very, um, primitive back then in 2019, and in 2021 I founded JPEG, which is a protocol for curation that proposes to have a network of curated galleries. Uh, we are only uh, working on the pipeline, basically, on the, um, on the back end, and then people would create their own galleries from there. We just uh, launched, uh, have our own gallery there. We also organize our own NFT drops. Uh, yeah, next week we're also gonna show some uh, community-owned galleries. Dan? I think. Oh, I can go next. Oh, oh. Um, do you wanna click through? Oh. I actually, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's I'm not in there, it's oh, okay. No, you're there. Oh, yeah, you are. Uh, well, that's. <laughs> Anyways, hi, I'm Holly. <laughs> I'm an artist based in Berlin. Um, I first got interested in what I like to call Web3 um, around 2014, where a lot of us were referring to it as the indie web. And that, that kind of came out of this feeling of um, uh, frustration with uh, Web2 platform politics. So, you know, everyone here is probably part of Instagram where you're kind of contributing to this platform, but you don't really feel like you have any say in how the platform is governed or any kind of kickback, um, monetarily speaking. So I made an album in 2015 called Platform that was really critical of this kind of paradigm. So that's kind of how I came to this space. I was really interested in the kind of economic mechanisms uh, that Web3 enables. Um, so in the kind of interim, I've been working a lot with uh, machine learning. And um, I'm just going to kind of like uh, condense things for the sake of time and talk about Holly Plus, which is my most recent project, which, which is where kind of Web3 and my machine learning research all kind of like culminates together in a way that I felt like was something that I wasn't really able to do before Web3. And so Holly Plus is a DAO, which is a, a decentralized autonomous organization, which is kind of like a fancy way of saying like a digital co-op. And this digital co-op kind of governs or shepherds my digital likeness. So a lot of the machine learning work that I've been doing, I've been dealing with voice modeling, instrument modeling, um, kind of likeness modeling. Um, so for example, um, OpenAI has this um, program called Clip, and Clip knows who I am. So I can type in my name, and Clip can kind of dream up and imagine my face, which is kind of amazing and insane and exciting. Um, brings up all kinds of questions around kind of like, you know, sovereignty and your digital likeness and, uh, you know, your, your kind of sense of, of ownership of self. Um, so we put together this, um, this cooperative and released uh, a couple tools to the wider public. We released uh, my speaking voice and one version of my singing voice that then the, the cooperative can, can govern um, authenticated versions of, the, of, uh, of um, uh, pieces that are made with those tools. So it's a complicated uh, project, but it's, it's a, uh, we're kind of playing with, instead of trying to be really tight with IP, we're trying to think of it more in terms of identity play. So instead of trying to control all of the uses of my voice online, I wanted to open it up and allow the public to be able to play with the tools, make their own work with my voice, and then have this uh, cooperative be able to kind of authenticate specific use cases. And that's something that's really unique to the, uh, to the NFT space, this idea of authenticating provenance or where something comes from. Um, so that's, that's kind of like the the, the short of, of what I've been working on, but I can play you a couple audio examples of things that have been made with Holly Plus. So if you play um, audio example number one. Uh, 
So this is the X-Files <laughs> uh, theme sung through the, uh, the current public version of Holly Plus. So if you go to holly.plus, you can drag an MP3 onto the website, and it will sing back whatever file you upload in my kind of AI voice. And it still has that kind of like scratchy neural net kind of sound. But I am going to play something really special for you guys today that's a bit of a premiere, if I can. <laughs> it's exciting. <laughs> um, so if we can stop that one. The next voice that I'm going to play you, this is something that we haven't released to the public yet, but we're planning to very soon. And it's just to show like the leaps forward that we've made in the kind of like um, uh, realistic um, sound quality of the voice. So if you can play sound file number two. Sing this. This is entirely computer generated. Okay, that's great. Thank you. So, as you can see, incredible. Er, uh, thank what you. an incredible <laughs> preview there. <clears throat> So as you can hear, it is really realistic now. And so we have to come up with entirely new structures of how we think about intellectual property and how we deal with our kind of digital um, twins and our different digital versions of ourselves. So that's it. That's so exciting. Thank you, Holly. Um, on, on to Dan. Uh, Do you need this? Um, yeah, maybe I, clip, I could. Clip, Maria? Clip through it. Um. Uh, I'm Dan. I'm the co-founder of Folia, which is essentially a <clears throat> publishing or kind of online gallery platform for NFTs. Uh, I'm actually much newer to the space than either Holly or Maria Paula. Um, I actually only have only been really involved in crypto for the last year, and actually my entree into NFTs more or less came through the decentralized finance space, also known as DeFi. Um, so I actually kind of got started more in there, and then naturally because my work previously was in kind of cultural production generally, live production, programming. Um, that just kind of naturally, I went towards that. Um, and this is one of the works that we've released. It's by Joan Heemskirk of Jody. Uh, Jody obviously is a very kind of like legendary net.art project. Um, and, oh, it runs. <laughs> this is the work. Maybe I can <laughs> pause it otherwise. I, this is, okay, great. Um, What's interesting about this work is that uh, what you see on the very bottom of the work, that number, that is a wallet address. And every time this work, or the token, moves to a different wallet, the work regenerates based on the wallet address. Um, another work that we've released is, let's do, we do the video. Lovely. This is Harm Van Den Dorpel's Mutant Garden Cedar. Um, and what you're seeing right now on the video is a new work is generated any time a block is produced on the Ethereum network. So there's a new block produced around every 13 seconds. The block hash is then taken and turned into a new artwork. And, and what's interesting about these works is that um, they continue to kind of mutate and regenerate based on the current block hash of Ethereum against the birth block hash of the work in question. Um, but yeah, that's, these are sort of the projects that we're doing, stuff that has a degree of medium spe specificity um, that's very much about kind of custom smart contract development, sometimes working, again, with people like Harm or, or Jody, who are actually have been making digital work for 10, 20, 30 years um, that in some cases are new to blockchain or in the case of Harm has actually been very involved for, for quite a long time. Fabulous. <clears throat> so that's a bit of an introduction to our illustrious uh, team. Um, now, I have a few questions that I'm going to throw at all of you. Um, and I think maybe you just kind of jump in, uh, you know, whenever. Um, obviously, you know, I think it's probably good for Art Basel people who just wandered into this thing to do a quick uh, definition check. Uh, it, very quick. Um, so who, <laughs> let's, let's say uh, NFTs, blockchains, um, uh, a history of art, and the blockchain, basically a timeline, just like when things kind of started up, when blockchains and art met. 
Um, and uh, yeah, maybe uh, then uh, skipping to sort of um, how things are compared to uh, that compared to today. So I don't know, maybe Maria Paola, you want to start with uh, your understanding of that. Uh, <laughs> okay. It's a tough one. I'm this sorry. Is off it's a very no, tough it's one. Not. Yeah. Um, so basically, blockchain experimentation with art and blockchain as a medium has existed probably since very early in Bitcoin. Uh, the first examples that I ac can actually think of, it's about colored coins and what it has to do with more with the ownership aspect of assets. So people have historically experimented with this. Then when actually Ethereum came about, Ethereum is basically a blockchain that's very expressive. And by expressive, I mean that you can do basically everything on top of it. So people started experimenting even more with the idea of ownership and with the idea of Ethereum uh, tied to smart contracts, which are basically the pipeline of Ethereum and how they work, and what they can do with a smart contract, which is obviously not a contract, but a bunch of code. Um, it has a language as well. So people started investigating, you know, these you know, are so-called contracts, what you can do in terms of art, what you can do in terms of conceptual art, mo most specifically. From there, of course, uh, a few years after the advent of Ethereum, we got uh, some creation of different class, uh, classes of tokens. Uh, ERC-20, it's the regular token that you know because you can buy it on Coin CoinGecko or uh, Co of CoinMarketCap. You, like, most of the assets around there are ERC-20s, which is a uh, you know, spawn of, Ether uh, of Ethereum as a chain. And uh, people started investigating what I can do with these tokens to turn them into part of my art. Then alongside came another token standard, the ERC721, which are non-fungible assets. They can't be divided. They're unique by design. And with the uniqueness of all of these, of course, uh, you know, people started wondering, OK, maybe this can represent uniqueness in terms of you know how to prove authenticity of an artwork how to prove the provenance and from there you, you know it, it is you know, tokens are very versatile so people started experimenting as well with tokens as a tool um, you know with authenticating you know digital files and even physical files so you know that's a little bit high level what do you think Dan? I mean that's <laughs> great I think I think one thing to maybe add to that is, you know, I, I was just speaking with the gallerist the fair, and they said, you know, we've been doing NFTs for years. Um, his point being that conceptually selling this, what is essentially a proof of authenticity for a work is not really that new. Um, but there's there's definitely layers to what uh, an NFT can be or an ERC721 can be, which is that some people, for some works, the smart contract is, is the work. For some, the token is actually the work. And for a lot of NFTs, probably the ones you hear the most about, it's just a token that essentially points to a JPEG somewhere that says, this token owns that work. Um, so that's, that's something to keep in mind. So there's, there's definitely kind of layers to how important, or again, how medium specific the token is to the work itself. Um, and it, that's from, it's again, just kind of a referent to the work versus it's very much the work itself and understanding and kind of enjoying the piece is very much about that token and having that token. Yeah, I mean, maybe one thing to just very quickly say to people who are really uh, green is that, uh, you know, blockchains were invented with Bitcoin in 2009. Uh, Bitcoin was basically an online spreadsheet that showed people what transactions happened between which uh, address and another address. That's sort of what Bitcoin is. Um, and then Ethereum was a kind of 2.0 of Bitcoin, which could do more in terms of having a programmable kind of like uh, operating system on top of it. But it's still at its heart a kind of list of transactions uh, that everybody on the internet can see, which is obviously then uh, pretty interesting to any kind of space that wants to use uh, a record of ownership, right? And, and art and art collecting is, a, I think, quite an obvious use case in some ways for a record on the internet of who owns what and uh, who transferred what amount of something to what. Uh, and uh, the NFT part of uh, why suddenly these things are a bit more liquid um, and, and, and more, uh, I think, 
visible um, in terms of activity is NFTs is a particular kind of format that unlike a currency, uh, unlike Bitcoin, uh, uh, it can change in value, like a painting can, right? So uh, a Warhol or a Frida Kahlo can go up and down in value, but it stay, the, the painting itself stays uh, the same object that holds that value. Um, uh, unlike a dollar, which is always a dollar, um, and is like every other dollar in the world. Um, and so uh, that's what an NFT is, just very briefly. It's a container for value that can shift, but hold, hold it for one particular position. So um, just, just for the very, very, very basics. I would just add one thing to that. You kind of touched on it a bit, but I think provenance is a really important component here. I mean, if you think about you know, like traditional auction houses, part of their service was that they could authenticate um, that, that somebody that, you know, you want to have made the object made the object. And now you can really see all of that on chain because you can see exactly which wallet spawned which work. Right. So that's kind of a really important aspect. Right, exactly. So that's all transparent. It's all online. Everybody can find it. Um, and that's a very uh, different and new thing. I would say maybe we should then pivot the conversation a little bit into what is new, exciting, and unique about this market format. Um, because I think it is a really interesting, it has properties uh, that are similar to the art world that I grew up in, for example. I went to art schools and I've shown in the fair for a very long time. Um, but it, it also has a slightly different um, qualities to it as well. Um, and uh, maybe I can start the ball rolling with that by uh, saying that um, I think when it's a purely digital asset on, on a blockchain that is traded, it can of course be traded very quickly internationally without crossing physical borders. So if you buy an artwork here, um, at the art fair, you have to ship it out. There's costs, there's customs, all these kinds of things. On the blockchain, you can, you can obviously, uh, you know, uh, trade it around the world several times a day, um, and uh, and that, you know, it's much more liquid as an asset, um, which is, I think, a huge difference. But maybe we can start into other differences because I know there are many. Um, did Maria Paula, do you sure. want to go first? Yeah. It's not only about, uh, of course, that's a re geographical uh, limits and you know, liquidity is a very important component. But the, you know, the most important component probably it's actually the community aspect mm. where, you know, first of all, you know, in general, when you uh, when you know you buy an art uh, you you buy an artwork from an artist, um, the artist doesn't tend to encourage secondary sales just because they don't get a cut. So there's like a disincentive, you know. Yeah. Uh, in blockchain, when uh, someone buys an asset, then you know the artist actually tends to encourage secondary sales. Why? Because uh, they create a bond with a collector, and the collector can actually make money out of that, and that's a great thing, you know. And of course, the artist gets royalties because that's encoded in whatever marketplace they are dealing with. So it's a fair sort of system in a way, of course. You know, there's like unfairness everywhere. I'm not trying to paint anything uh, pink here. So that's really important. Also, you know, the relationships that you get between collectors and artists is a little bit different. Sometimes uh, artists will, you know, do uh, an NFT drop just for the collectors that own, you know, one of their assets. Uh, one of the examples is actually one of the highest selling artists right now, uh, Def Beef, that launched a series of NFTs. And then, you know, he only allowed the people that hold those NFTs to buy their own works. And that creates a community of people that are, you know, tightly knitted, they have the same values, they value the artist, they want the, uh, you know, they want to make money together as well, which is a nice thing uh, in this hyper financial, uh, financialist world. Um, so, and then of course, you know, you have people like Holly. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, basically, you know, you're back reward, uh, retroactively rewarding the collectors of your work by inviting them to a DAO where they can collaborate and, you know, have governance over your likeness. Mm -hmm. So there's many different things that you can do and you can play with ownership and community. And I think that's so important for an, uh, in the NFT world. Yeah. That's so great. Um, and maybe I'll ask Dan a similar related question because I think you there's a community aspect of what you were saying and then there's also this kind of different market incentive for secondary sales in particular, right, that you're saying. So maybe Dan, do you want to go into a little bit how you see the mechanisms of that work compared to you know, how an artwork might be sold in the art world? Right. Um, 
I mean, I'd maybe back up by also just kind of saying, at least, you know, like my theory for, for why we've seen such insane kind of exuberance in the NFT market, I think does start with DeFi to some degree and, and certain market structures that have changed, for instance, since the initial like CryptoKitties boom in, uh, you know, two or three years ago. And the, like, there's two probably really big differences. One is the amount of stable coin volume on chain. Um, there's now, I think, close to $100 billion in stable coins. Stable coins are just basically any coin that is ostensibly backed by fiat somewhere. So the most common ones are USDT or USDC. These are USD-backed stable coins. Um, and those didn't really exist, or at least in volume, um, you know, three years ago when there was the, kind of the last big bull up in the market. Um, and it used to be if you wanted to hold crypto, you had to hold a volatile asset. So that's changed. You can, you can keep uh, liquidity on chain without being exposed to market volatility. Right. So that, that makes the, in general, just makes the, oh, is that the? That's an announcement. That's uh, the announcement. <laughs> Are they kicking us Great out? Great stable coin point, <laughs> coin point though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are at a fair <laughs> after all. Yeah. yeah. Your flight is boarding. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> I think you just have to power I'm, through. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. yeah. So, anyways, so that's changed. You don't need to hold a volatile asset to hold crypto anymore, essentially. And and so that actually meant that the liquidity that was there actually stayed there. Um, so there's that, that liquidity doesn't have necessarily an incentive to go back to the fiat system or go back into a traditional bank. So there's that. And then I think the second thing is certain just new DeFi products. Again, DeFi is just kind of a fancy word for saying on-chain banking. So this allows you to borrow and lend assets um, and do it almost as easily as you would order takeout. You know, you can go on, on a Sunday evening, you can take your Ethereum or you can take your stable coins, you can put it into a protocol which will also give you a yield on those and you can also borrow against those. So basically, all of a sudden, just the amount of money that was kind of sitting there on chain grew immensely. Yeah. Uh, you know, it went from about $1 billion of assets in DeFi to I think it's close to $100 billion now, I think, in, in these different protocols. Um, so you can imagine that, I mean, what often follows after banking is art buying. <laughs> quite naturally. So I think that was a, was, is a very, very big change and is probably somewhat responsible for what we're seeing in 2021 versus what happened in 2017 and 2018. Mm. Um, to the point about the secondary market sales, yeah, there's just kind of interesting, the dynamics of the market are very different than what you'd probably see at a fair, right? Because most galleries, the idea, most of them focus on primary sales, the split is 50-50. Um, and there's actually, you know, some dealers do specialize in secondary, but very few actually do both and do it well. Um, the fees in the NFT world are actually starting to normalize, and the normal split is actually 85-15, artist, dealer, slash marketplace, slash whoever. Um, so the people who are kind of helping create or sell the work um, on the back end are, are taking a much, much smaller cut. On top of that, it's, very, it's actually fairly easy to guarantee secondary sale royalties, which is obviously also not the case in the trad art market world, I think. I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm guessing you probably haven't seen too many. Never. Yeah, there you go. Um, so it's kind of a similar dynamic. There's, uh, for most kind of fine art sales in the NFT market, that's about 10%. That's kind of a standard. Um, royalty on every single sale, and that is enforced by smart contracts, usually on OpenSea, but again, also on several other marketplaces. Um, with that in mind, your secondary cut is almost as big as your primary cut if, if you're producing these works. Uh, so there's actually a lot more incentive to price the works lower, do larger addition sizes, uh, addition sizes and just get the work circulating. Because the more it circulates, the more it moves around, the more people see it, the more people own it, the more people get involved with the work, and that actually doesn't affect your sales. It's actually good for your sales. So there's a lot less focus on kind of doing this traditional primary market thing where you're kind of sussing out who's buying it, are they gonna, are they gonna hold on to it, do they have a good collection, is it gonna go to an institution? You're not really doing that. You're actually thinking, okay, I want this to move, and then I want it to actually keep moving or I want, I want more people to see it and I want, I want this person to get a piece of it so they're gonna go talk about it and they're gonna be excited about it and maybe their friends will buy it. So I think this sort of, this dynamic, this different fee dynamic really explains 
what we what's a very 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 high velocity market, um, especially compared to what we see normally. It's just a completely different market structure. Mm. Holly, do you have a reflection on some differences uh, for you? I mean, I would agree with most of what you said, but I would disagree with some of it. I don't think it's all about kind of uh, circulation. I think a lot of collectors are also collecting for the long term, and the, actually most of my collectors have collected for the long term. I don't really have a lot of secondary sales, and I like it that way because I mostly do one of ones. Uh, so one of one is like when you just do one piece, and then there's all these kind of series where you do like a thousand works, and you start out with a really low price so more people can buy in and then those usually land on the secondary market and people start trading and it becomes a kind of almost like its own currency where people are trading and it, it really is a new paradigm. I agree with what you're saying there with people coming out of DeFi where it's like, I think most people think about art collecting as something that, you know, maybe they would let it appreciate over a year or five years or over a generation and now it's like over a couple hours, right? And then it's like flipped to the next thing and, and so a lot, of the, a lot of the economy and a lot of the culture is very um, focused on that. But there is also a kind of slower, uh, you know, maybe more long-term uh, community as well that maybe I interact with a little bit more. I'm not, ag I'm not opposed to, to either community. I, I, I think they're both fascinating. Um, one thing that I, that I find really interesting and new is that, you know, you have this community coming out of DeFi who, you know, we're all coming out of COVID, so everyone's spending a lot of time essentially like day trading online and that's where a lot of this community is coming out of and now you have all of these day traders who are you know hyper online they're trading artworks and that is turning into its own language and its own understanding of aesthetics and you see kind of like you know what people like to call crypto bros or whatever you see them talking about aesthetics and provenance and copyright and all these kind of things and like some of the conversations are really like you know undergraduate art school and you're kind of like okay let's you know let's interact with people who have thought about this a little bit more maybe but also some of it's really beautiful because they, they are kind of developing their own kind of language and their own aesthetics out of it and and that's what I find really exciting about it is that it you know instead of I, I feel like oftentimes the art world this is like such an awful generalist term it is like okay how do we how do we show blockchain like aesthetics or how do we bring culture to this and it's like it already is a culture and it's right. like a fascinating culture that's that's a really fast moving one and a very exciting and um, a very inclusive one you know it, in many ways where kind of more traditional institution institutions have failed to um, have a really global perspective or um, be really inclusive in some ways blockchain has done a much, much better job or the NFT space because so much of it is anonymous so much of it is kind of like 24 7 you don't have to be living living in a big city, um, paying big city rents to, to participate. Yeah. Of course there are still barriers and there are still gatekeepers, but that's what I find fascinating about it. I'm really obsessed with the weird culture that's coming out of it. Mm, maybe that's a good moment to move on to um, speaking about uh, who's collecting, maybe, um, and who's making uh, NFTs. Because I think you, you're hinting towards the fact that there is a, a kind of a, an inherent community of people who are really excited about doing this and uh, all over the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, you know, we're, in a, we're in an IRL, uh, one, the, or the premium IRL uh, art fair in the world, you know, where, the, where the art world comes to uh, do sales and, and, and see new work. Um, uh, yeah, maybe we can talk about the different communities involved in, in, in NFTs and collecting and making. Oh. Yeah. I actually really like that the NFT space is uh, really about removal of layers mm. of, uh, of labels. Actually, you can be a collector and then you can, you know, start trading the NFTs and, you know, get a lot of capital and then organize your uh, your own drop with artists that you love. So uh, ev every label in the NFT world can change from one t uh, from one moment to the to the other. One day I'm a collector, one day I'm, one day I'm a creator, and one day I may be a curator because you know you can also curate via not necessarily via my platform, of course, but via Twitter threads. Uh, I see a lot of people that are you know selecting their favorite pieces, and I see a lot of people that curate uh, through a public wallet, which you can see on a portal that's called uh, OpenSea. So a lot of people start uh, migrating their favorite NFTs to those wallets, forming some kind of gallery. And then that's the way to express they are tastemakers in the space. Um, I love the fact that the NFT world, because it's so internet native and it's so open-minded, 
it has uh, somehow worked itself through, uh, through all of these, you know, not uh, putting people into one box, but more about expanding and collaborating all together. Um, so, yeah, it's quite open-ended for me. Maybe that's a good uh, transition also into some of the kind of basic infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. For like, where, where do NFTs happen, right? Because I think that's an interesting question to ask at an art fair as well. Is it like, mm -hmm. what platforms do you discover on? How do you share them? You know, like these kind of also these basic things. Because I mean, from my understanding, it's kind of like Twitter, a few publishing platforms, and maybe Discord communities. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can explain like those things and maybe I've missed something. Uh, Holly, do you want to start with that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I personally mint on Foundation, and I have you know a profile there, and that's where a lot of my discovery takes place. But also through Twitter, um, a lot of the larger run collections that uh, Dan was talking about earlier, um, you'll get access to a Discord if you uh, hold the token in your wallet, and then or sometimes it's not even token um, gated. Sometimes it's just a community on Discord, and you'll have thousands of people. I'm in a, a very kind of strange. Uh, uh, old rock discord where I'm it, there's like six languages and 2,000 people and we're all discussing this uh, rock token project that was minted in 2017 and we're all arguing about how to wrap it and put it on OpenSea and it's so much fun and it's so weird yeah. but I, I still feel like it's pretty um, limited you know like OpenSea is such a free-for-all you know for that to be where people show these these collections that they're really proud of um, feels like kind of yeah, just not really there yet. So um, yeah, I feel like that's a part of the space that'll develop probably a lot over the next year. Mm. Yeah, I'm not like I don't know. I'm like I'm like 50/50 <laughs> all the time on that. Like what it's going to actually end up looking like. I mean, right now when you're kind of in the NFT world, what does that mean? You're kind of in this proto metaverse stack, which is a uh, mix of you're on Twitter, which is we also call crypto Twitter, which is just this kind of a specific set of people that kind of everybody follows and a kind of a conversation that everyone's following. So you're on crypto Twitter, you're on Discord. What is um, Discord? Because I think a lot of people don't know what It's Discord basically is. just a chat. It's just a big chat room apps where you can just have lots of different chat rooms. Yeah. So there's Discord, there's Telegram, which is, again, also basically a talking app. Um, and then you also have kind of platforms like Foundation or Zora um, or Super Rare. Those are kind of the major ones. And then OpenSea, which is kind of where all the secondary market sales are. Um, so yeah, it's basically almost like this weird text-based RPG where kind of you're constantly reading stuff on different things and talking to different people. Like you go into the Discord where there's a bunch of what we call maybe NFT archaeologists. This is, this is a relatively new development. <laughs> Once you have an art market, then you need people to discuss it and figure out its history. So now we have NFT archaeologists. So you go into their Discord and they're going to tell you about rocks. So you go into the rock Discord, you think, oh, this might be an interesting project. You ask, where can I mint it? They send you like an Etherscan link. Etherscan is where you just read what happens on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, maybe they send you to a front end. The thing is, it's actually extremely distributed. And it's very, that's also probably one of the problems with like why it feels like relatively opaque, a lot of this stuff, is because you're actually, you're reading a lot of different sources and you're constantly staying up to date with a lot of them. Um, and it doesn't really just happen in one place. You're kind of bouncing from place to place. Um, yeah. Right, but you know, on the uh, at the same you know time, um, if you are full time NFT trader, there's also tools that can help you. Um, oh. You can read some data on the re really really good data dashboards. For example, Nansen is a platform that basically has a bunch of token data, and you can watch wallets, you can watch uh, different drops, you can watch the market activity. So when something is about to drop, you see higher volume, and then you can jump into that drop. Um, I myself have trouble reading data, but there's a lot of people that love it. So, you know, discovery not only happens, you know, on Twitter, Discord, uh, your DMs, um, and whatever, whatever, or, you know, the platforms that are more curated, but uh, also because NFTs are a place where, you know, geeks and financial people and artists sort of converge. Um, they also created their own data data platform. So you know, in case you you like that kind of you know, like following the the market activity, you can you can just delve into data and you know, get some decent revenue as well. I, but this is not financial advice, by the way. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, 
I wonder, uh, we're, we're hitting uh, 45 minutes now, and I'm wondering if um, it's time to open up for some questions to the audience. I think we've established a little bit of the energy, some of the main places where things take uh, activity, uh, some projects. Um, uh, does anybody want to ask uh, our esteemed panelists something? Um, I see a hand at the back. Hello. Uh, Hi. It's working. Cool. Um, yeah, uh, I've got two questions. So the first question is around um, the exploding cost of gas fees, uh, particularly on Ethereum. Um, how do you think the community will manage that? And what's your thoughts? Holly? Well, actually, two days ago, I just used a new contract that Zora put together where I was able to mint 300 NFTs direct to wallet for less than one Ether, which that's nerd speak for like, <laughs> for like you know, I think, I think cheap people, fees. really cheap fees. I think there are going to be some workarounds for kind of like batching things in that way that, that will help out. But in general, I do think that the, the cost of gas right now is, uh, is a problem. I mean, yeah. for, for entry, for sure. But as a platform developer, as a platform founder, not developer myself, we're also looking at layer two solutions. Layer two, you know, for example, there's one that's called Polygon, decreases the um, the gas cost by about a thousand, and of course, also that decreases sort of the carbon footprint uh, because you you know you tend to batch transactions and use different uh, different methods but also this is not only about ethereum i build on ethereum i love ethereum um, but you also have other platforms you know like uh, the Tesla's one, he could, he, he could, no? Yeah, there's also Solana and Solana, Kusama, yeah. and there's a lot of uh, proof yeah. of stake options as right. well. Right, so y you have options, you don't have to pay the fees. But it's not as quite, it's not as easy in plug and play, uh, nothing's right. plug and play, but like if you do mint something on Polygon and you want to kind of airdrop that to someone's For sure. ETH wallet, there's like multiple steps. So things are still awkward, but um, I would say they are <laughs> in process. It's yeah. awkward, but it's less awkward than, you know, handling a, an online banking platform. That's how. This is true, that's true. It's really counterintuitive. Yeah. You know, we're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a second question from the same position or another from the, we have another middle here, another one in the middle, white cap. Can I take my mask off? Or do Hi, how's it going? Um, so I have two questions. Basically, uh, the first one is I wanted to see what your opinion is regarding like the evolution of NFTs. I'm definitely gonna shill a project or an <laughs> NFT project that I'm a part of. It's called Curse to Share where they're doing the first dynamic NFT and they're actually taking like uh, price feeds through the chain, uh, chain link network, keeper network, and they're like, the NFT basically changes off of prices of Ethereum. And so I see that as like a kind of like almost an evolution in NFTs and I was curious if you have any other, you know, projects that you know of doing something that is like different in the NFT world. Mm -hmm. And then my second question is like, just like crypto and NFTs, I mean, there's so much pump and dump stuff going on and like, you know, there's the poop coins, you know, the ass coins. It's the same thing in like the NFT world, I feel like. So I want to ask like, 90% of this stuff will probably be gone in the next five, 10 years. So like what type of NFTs in your opinion is going to like hold value and like have this longevity and like really bring something or like be valuable in the future? Because it's kind of like the wild west right now. Okay, two huge questions and uh, and a promotion. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I would I would promote my own projects. Uh, in, in <laughs> <laughs> to your to your to your question, um, I mean, it, it's kind of the same thing with this fair, though. I mean, it, if you come here, if you come to fairs long enough, it's like same thing. You know, there's there's a lot of turnover in terms of, of narratives and work and styles over the years. Um, obviously, the same thing's going to happen in, in NFTs, and it's probably going to happen even faster because of just how quickly everything is, is still developing. Again, we just got art critics, uh, I would say a few weeks ago, maybe. So um, <laughs> let's see how that goes first. A lot, of, a lot of them will be deciding what does end up being important. It's actually very hard to say what the future looks like. I have, I have high conviction about certain projects. Again, a lot of the ones that I'm involved with. I think thoughtful stuff like what Holly is doing. Um, 
and like you can maybe look at already things like CryptoPunks or Lar Larva Lab stuff like Autoglyphs and say like, okay, these are things that are already important. Um, it's hard to say because again, right now there's also so much focus on kind of medium specificity and bringing things on chain, but you know, that would be the equivalent of also allowing like a TI-86 graphing calculator to decide the future of art history. So you know, how far that can go, for instance, I don't think that can last forever. Um, I, I think at some point, you know, the art will want to kind of like break free of certain, certain technical limitations um, that are specific to blockchains. Um, what does that end up looking like? I don't know. I mean, the other big question, obviously, is what happens when, when does this kind of NFT market and all these NFT works kind of start to converge with things that are happening here and with the kind of market on this side? I don't think they can be separated forever. I think when those things collide, we're going to understand, I think, a lot better what the kind of future of all of these things looks, looks like, but I actually, I have no idea. Interesting. <laughs> I think there's a lot of copycat projects out there right now, like just doing these kind of like large volume works because they see that that worked for someone else and just kind of like trying to print money and, you know, get as much as possible. And that in and of itself is an interesting art project. <laughs> it's like a cultural <laughs> phenomenon, but maybe the individual projects aren't so interested. I, interesting. I'm interested in a lot of artists who have really utilized um, what makes the blockchain uh, special. Artists like Sarah Friend, who's in the back of the audience here, or uh, Rhea Myers, who are really doing things that weren't maybe possible before. Um, kind of in interesting kind of contract work. Um, so that kind of stuff, I think, is, is is artists learning what's unique about the space and really expressing that. And yeah, that's, and also just seeing artists who maybe have a track record with, with digital work or with kind of bringing in kind of conceptual ideas and not just trying to kind of print money really quickly. Right. We have not yet decided what cultural significance uh, means in the blockchain world. I think that we are making great strides towards uh, doing that, but we're still not quite there. Of course, there's some things like, uh, you know, CryptoPunks, other autoglyphs uh, that we do know that they have cultural significance because uh, of their longevity as well, and not so much about the richness of the project or some works that are actually conceptually very rich, like uh, digital zones of uh, immaterial uh, pictorial sensibility, which is a, like a digital copy of the Yves Klein work. But until we actually converge and start criticizing and curating and deciding what is actually uh, you know, meant for posterity and what has cultural significance, and what does that mean even in the blockchain world? I don't think that we will be able to establish you know, which is you know, one that's here to stay. Other questions up the back there or on the side? Hi. Okay. Yeah, um, as countries make decisions on the legality of cryptocurrencies, such as China recently banning cryptocurrency, what impact does that have on NFTs? China bans crypto every one month or so. <laughs> it's like a, a women's period, so I wouldn't be so worried about that. Bullish. Bullish. <laughs> Bullish. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's huge questions about, I mean, specifically for the NFT space, KYC, AML, what does that look like? How do you what, enforce it? What is it? KYC? Um, KYC is know, know your customer. AML is mm -hmm. anti-money laundering. Most galleries, I think maybe, I don't know exactly what it is, but I think for Europe it's like at, at a 10,000 uh, euro mm -hmm. line, you need to actually, above that, you need to kind of know exactly who you're selling to and you need to keep a record of their identity. Um, there's also just in general the question of yeah how do you how do you tax cryptocurrencies how do you regulate them um, are are they securities which cryptos are securities these are kind of all things that are being decided right now China probably again they ban it every month they don't really matter I think a lot of people are waiting to see what the U S does and the U S is very much in the process of rolling that stuff out right now and that's again I actually I don't know what's going to happen that will absolutely. Whatever happens, it will material, materially impact the NFT market without a doubt. Yeah. Um, that's what allows for obviously such high frequency trading at, at such kind of large valuations. That's because there is actually very little regulation in the space, or at least kind of easily enforceable and, and easily um, kind of understood regulation. So when that stuff becomes clearer, that's absolutely going to impact the market. But there actually hasn't been a lot of signaling at what that is going to look like. I think one thing that might be non-obvious to people who aren't so in this space is how many pseudonymous 
um, leaders right. there are in the space. So not anonymous, but rather pseudonymous, where they have an avatar, they have a name, like the crypto dog or something. It's like a dog with sunglasses, something absurd. But then they have like hundreds of thousands of followers. They're listed on white papers as like advisors. They're tr these avatars are treated as like thought leaders in the space and given a lot of um, power, essentially. And so I think it being such a deregula deregulated space or unregulated space um, allows for pseudonymous activity in this way that's really interesting culturally, but we'll see if that will be able to continue. But anyways, doesn't that happen also in the traditional art world? Because all of those freeports without labels or without KY, and of course, the art world also don't ha doesn't have KYC. You know, you can fill out a form and you can lie about everything. Um, so, <laughs> I'm not sorry. A, not it's at not this fair. <laughs> 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 well, that, that's kind of the, the next thing is that, you know, after crypto regulations and when do we get our free ports? Right. <laughs> well, we, we do have our free it's ports. It's in your MetaMask wallet it's right it's now. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, right right now we're all free. In, in crypto, everyone's a free port now, but uh, we'll see what happens when Where that changes. Where value is subjective, there's always opacity in, those, uh, in that regard, you know, uh, with KYC, with, you know, what's the value of something, with invoicing KYC. Oh, KYC already said that. Um, so, yeah, if the art world has been doing well with all of these, then why not N NFTs? Another question in the mix. <laughs> I see one on the side. Um, so two questions again. One is around sustainability. And when, especially, when I, I'll say I'm a rather uninformed green person in this space. But for that, is it, is it a sustainable thing with having multiple secondary markets and promoting further sales? Is that consuming more resources than normal currencies somehow? And then the second question was, what I just, we were talking about the artists and the geeks and the finance people all having a platform that collides now, but then there's this huge space of the normal worker who might feel very left out from this. And is, is it exclusive to the, this group of people or is there any expansion into making it more relatable? I mean, the vocabulary itself is so specialized. I mean, the, the way I think about, I think when it comes to just kind of energy consumption and NFTs is what, what, what essentially blockchains do is they kind of change the way trust is mediated. And obviously, for instance, if I want to go buy Simon's work at his, from his gallerist, that actually involves many, many parties and many, many steps, right? I need to go to his gallerist. His gallerist brought a bunch of people here. They packed up work. It came from his studio. It might have actually been shown somewhere else. They, sh they shipped it over here. They also have to have lawyers and insurance and pay storage fees to make sure that this work stays safe and that if anything happens to it, someone can get sued and they can be responsible for it if there isn't somebody responsible for it. Um, and then I made it as well, right? Like, right, well, <laughs> and I that didn't take so much energy, and, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't really make it. Yeah. But Thank you. Yeah. But essentially, kind of like all of these relationships, I mean, there's, there's a huge complex web of relationships that goes into me getting Simon's work. Um, and when you do the same thing on, on Ethereum, it's actually just this one transaction. You know, you're kind of collapsing this entire web of trust into just literally one smart contract transaction. I can read the contract, I know what it says. I call the, I call the contract, it sends him uh, whatever the settlement value is, I get the work and it's settled, that's it. There's no, again, there's no kind of insurance la layer, there's no legal layer. It's kind of all done, mediated, and, and we can confidently say that it's settled. So I think that's kind of the general framework I use to kind of think about these things is that you're taking this actually, it's a very, very complex web of trust with a lot of different people involved in a lot of different steps and a lot of time and space that goes into that and actually just, it's now just kind of one electronic transaction. So that's, that's I think, one way to think about the, the energy part of it. Uh, maybe for the second part of the question, um, it's true. Uh, it costs a lot of money to transact on Ethereum. It's pretty much priced out any normal human being. Um, I would say that the, there is kind of one bright side, which is that I know plenty of people who have gotten kind of involved in these communities literally just by hanging out in the chat rooms, and they actually are able to get work or get jobs or get, you know, tons of opportunities without having to put in anything other than their time. Um, so while on the one hand, no, you, most people cannot afford to, to use these things in their current state, um, you can still actually very much be involved in a, in a very serious material way without having to spend a dime. But you do have to spend your time. 
I was living in the Bay Area when a lot of the kind of Web 2 platforms were getting really big. And you wouldn't be able to just kind of like drop by on Facebook and see like how is their team dealing with um, content moderation. On the flip side, with a lot of Web3 stuff, the code is often um, available for everyone to see. Often you can have a kind of governance stake in it if you get involved. And so it's not barrier free for sure, but it is a thousand times more open than the development of Web2. It does require a lot of time and patience and technical know-how. But if you're willing to invest that time and really go deep on things, there is more, you have more access to information for how things are coming about than we did in the previous paradigm. And I think that that's something, that's a story that's often not really told about the Web3 space. Yeah, we weren't born crypto natives. We all sort of started learning and started researching on the internet or hanging out in chat rooms and eventually that led to a job or to starting your own thing. So. You know, the good thing about actually the the crypto industry it might look like you know it has wall gardens or it's like a very 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 steep learning curve, but in reality we're much more open-minded. We live on the internet. We have seen it all already. It's like we have seen the crap and the good things. So you know, if you <laughs> come, we'll probably you know get resources for you to learn and join. Okay. Uh, we have another one in here. I love these questions. Uh, <laughs> this is opening up the panel so much. Um, yeah. I, I haven't been tracking who put up whose hand first, so I'm sorry if there's a, you know. It's just a continuation of sustainability question. What are your moral and ethical vision on this NFTs? Aren't we creating kind of fast fashion versus craftsmanship? Aren't we encouraging, uh, like we reconsider what art is when we exchange, when buy and sell, we create what we are fighting today in the financial world. I'm a banker and we're kind of, we want to uh, like stop living in that bubble, financial bubble that is created when they, it will burst and everybody will suffer. So we're creating kind of another bubble maybe or not. And uh, this is really, aren't we encouraging artists not to have that self-expression, but creation for trading? I think there's some interesting binaries that you're suggesting there, which I'm not sure that I personally as an artist would align with. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I agree that uh, the craft is necessarily material. I think you can have a coding craft and you can have a social craft. And in the histories of conceptual art that I was brought up with, uh, you know, uh, a social craft is a part of the publishing and making of the artwork. Um, so that would be one thing that I push back on there. And the other thing is, um, you know, uh, value of uh, the way that art is made uh, is often connected to, uh, you know, some kind of tradable system. Um, and this is, of course, migrating onto something that looks a little bit more liquid, that looks a little bit more like other types of. Um, uh, I don't know, uh, fi more financialized versions of that. Um, uh, but it didn't start, <laughs> that culture didn't start in the art world. Um, and we live and we live in this world. So again, I as an artist um, feel that uh, participating in this context um, has a craft and uh, the ethics was something that were, uh, you know, that the, the wider world created uh, as well. You know, um, I don't know, it's, do other people have thoughts on that? I like what you said. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 was, I was reading through, before I came here, I was on the train, and I was reading the um, Art Basel UBS report. And I think this is actually, there's this, there was this one graph that tells you kind of um, all the work by medium uh, as a kind of well, a percentage of the total sales of all art sold. And there was, there's two numbers that stuck out to me. 1% of the work was digital. 1% of all work, work sold by volume was digital. And 60% was painting. And I would say that's fundamentally a function of the market um, and function of just kind of, again, all of these things that we were talking about, which is like lawyers and, and making sure the work can be shipped easily and that you know what you're getting and that it, it fits easily into your house and you don't need to build a reinforced floor for it or get an expensive monitor or keep software to keep it running. Um, that will tell you everything. I mean, why is 60% of you know, the total work by volume paintings? Do we still live in a world that is defined by painting as, as a medium? That, that, is that the medium that does the best job? Considering that we all have smartphones, why is only 1% of that work digital? 
I think that is fundamentally, uh, that's 100% the market. Um, so again, I mean, I would say that actually this, that's what I like about NFTs. I, I think initially saw it as an opportunity to kind of push digital art because actually it gave it a market. And by giving it a market, then an artist would have the opportunity to really take their time and really create great digital work, which they weren't really incentivized to do before. I don't think it's necessarily productive for me to moralize around the creative activity of young people making works and trading them online. I feel like it is a, it is a new, it's such a new community interaction that it's worth experimenting and letting it play out and letting people play before we immediately jump to conclusions that were maybe formed fr from 20th century narratives that may no longer apply to our daily lives. Mm. So I would say maybe suspend a little bit of that judgment. Mm. Okay. I don't know how we're going for time, but we have another burning question, I think, here in the front row. Yeah. I think that I, I think of two broad types of artwork that are available in the marketplace. One, uh, a single time purchase um, you know, piece of artwork that's maybe a painting that can then be resold, which I think you touched on a lot. And then I think about consumable artwork, things like music, uh, books, uh, movies, where people will go to a platform and they'll, you know, pay a licensing fee to, to consume that artwork one time or, you know, for a period of time. How do you think NFTs will evolve sort of that, that latter space where, you know, there's uh, consumables like books, music, movies, things of that nature? Holly, you may be most adjacent to this. Yeah, I think tokenized access to subscriptions going to be a thing. I'm working on a thing like that right now <laughs> with some friends of mine. We're working on a project called Channel um, because we're trying to move away from Patreon for the, our collective podcast, so to create a kind of new channel that could be um, seasonally owned with tokenized um, access. So I think that's one way. Um, I think there's a really interesting project called Audius that's trying to challenge the current streaming um, paradigm of Spotify. You know, if any of you all know any kind of working musicians, you know that the streaming rates are basically a joke. And it's not just the rates, it's also this idea that art could be valued on a per play valuation, right? Like, I don't need to listen to a, a really kind of complicated, dissonant um, orchestral piece on repeat in the background of my dinner party to, so that they can earn their one dollar a year. That's something I only n need to listen to maybe once. That for messy my on track isn't getting a repeat, <laughs> right? No. For my ears and my, uh, you know, my, uh, my worldview to have changed. So this idea of, of tokenized access to something I think could really work for, for music specifically that, isn't, um, that doesn't function in this kind of per play valuation paradigm that we're currently in. Okay. I really am going to ask how we're doing for time, because I feel like we're over. But yeah, we're over. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very, very much uh, for joining us here today. Thank you so much to our uh, panel. You. It's been a wonderful conversation uh, and a wonderful place for it. Thank you, uh, Basel, for hosting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.